Good, 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 good. Good, 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 good. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to Slump Buster Fantasy Football Podcast with Eris Blakely, episode 10, recording here on Sunday, October 27th, 2019. Find us on all major stream platforms. On today's episode, Eris and I break down NFL Week 8, Drew Brees' return to the field, Tevin Coleman's big day, and everything you need to know, bust the slump and gain those fantasy football playoffs. Without further ado, here's our show. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Another week in the books, week eight. We are pretty much halfway done now. Most teams have played eight games. Next week will be the for real halfway point where every team will play eight games this year. So we are flying through the season. We only have a couple more weeks until playoffs come on for our fantasy purposes. So let's just get right into the show. Today we have a guest again this week. We got Juju with us. How are you doing today, Juju? Doing great, man. I just want to say congratulations. This is going to be the 10th fantasy football episode. So double digits. Woo, woo. Congrats, Eris. Um, I'm, I'm really glad we've gotten to 10. Uh, hopefully, my, my goal, though, at the beginning of the season was to make it one <laughs> season. Just, just make it one, and then we'll see how it is. Well, Matt, I, I could definitely say this. The show quality keeps getting better and better. I think our listeners are happy with what you're doing. I hear a lot of positive feedback about the fantasy football show. And, hey, I'm glad to pull the end to the Slump Buster Media family. And we just continue growing. Like, Instagram's killing it right now. The meme game is strong and growing stronger every day. Oh, yeah. We have all three incredible shows, except for Andre, you know? just I'm still <laughs> mad at him because his, his team beat me. So I'm still, I'm still mad at him. But, yeah, eh, we can I mean, get over it. I mean, is this kind of like the spoiler alert that you're trying to replace Andre, at least this week? At least this week, yeah. On the Slump I'm, Buster. I'm, I'm, re- I'm taking over your spot this week. On the Slump Buster with Juju and Dre, Dre is going to sound slightly different. Maybe just for shits and giggles, we can bring back that really weird British accent you do and just yeah, kind of like pass it. We had a British game. We had an English game today. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Okay, it's a good thing that I have some – very, very British co-workers that have agreed to lend their voice to the very final British game. So no more horrible impressions. So <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> we get some actual British people. Actual Brits that are probably tired of us offending their culture so, so much. <laughs> yeah. So just on that point, guys, next week it is a London game again, but it's another morning game. So it's going to be my time. It's going to be 730 uh, your time, it's going to be 8.30. So just remember, especially if you're in California, like that's a 6.30 start time. You got to make sure you're up and you have everything ready to go. It's fine, man. I already have my game plan for that. I'm going to just get my George Foreman grill, just lay out some strips of bacon there, kind of like get that smell of bacon going all there you go. fresh in the morning. And then hopefully not step on the grill while I'm going to turn on the television for the game. Yeah, just sleep with it in <laughs> your bed so you can just roll over and turn it on. Yeah. Shout out to my office fans right there. <laughs> well, all righty. So <laughs> let, let's get into this week. Um, we had some pretty big news. We had some, you know, some big trades go down. Trade deadline is on Tuesday, so this will probably be out in time for that deadline. But we saw Emmanuel Sanders to your team. You guys are finally getting a number one mm-hmm. receiver, and we saw that pay off right away. How do you yeah. like that trade? Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely talk about his performance when we actually get into the game itself. But overall... As a fan, how do you feel as a fan? As a fan, it's definitely nice to see whenever your team's actively trying to compete and actively trying to establish themselves as contenders because obviously there's been a lot of doubt on are the Niners legit, are they for real this season? And I think when you go out and add like a big name like Emmanuel Sanders to your team, it says, oh yeah, we're trying to compete this year, we're trying to win a title and it established yourself as one of the top-tier teams of the league. Now, Emmanuel Sanders, the player as a whole, so let's face it, he is a 30-plus-year-old wide receiver, which I don't mind just because when you look at the Niners roster as a whole, we have like Dante Pettis, we have Debo Samuel, we have, we have Bourne, we have Trent Taylor. We have all these like young guys. I don't think any of them are over 25. So adding a veteran presence to that locker room is very much needed. And then when you look at a guy like Sanders, who's really one of the better slot receivers in football the last few years, despite his Achilles tear, he definitely adds like a nice security blanket over the middle for Jimmy G. And I think that's going to elevate his play because we've been missing Trent Taylor and we've been missing Jalen Hurd this entire season in the slot. And I feel like that's been one of Jimmy G's bigger faults over the course of the season. Oh yeah. I also think it's going to open up because he's a deep threat. He likes going down the field. It's going to open up George Kittle in the middle. Um, yeah. 
So, so I think it just benefits all around. I definitely think it boosts every offensive piece on that Niners roster right there. And I think if you do have Niners stock, it's definitely the time to invest. Yeah, there you go. So the, so the next trade was Mohamed Sanu. He went to bed one and six and woke up undefeated. Um, that's, <laughs> that, that's got to be an awesome feeling. But he went to the Patriots from Atlanta for a second round, which I kind of saw was a bit pricey for him. His numbers haven't been astronomical. I, I don't think it was worth a second round pick. But, I mean, with the Patriots, if he's, he's going to have 1,000 yards, 17 touchdowns this year if the Patriots see him as a second round pick Mm -hmm. I mean when you look at the Patriots they needed to make some kind of motion right now as far as their wide receiving unit so we had that weird Josh Gordon story pop up where is he injured is he not is he just going to get cut straight up and is there going to be a market for him when he does interesting (laughs) yeah it's definitely I mean Josh Gordon Every year we have some kind of weird Josh Gordon story. It's just a matter of this one's weird because he's not having to stay off the weed. Okay, Stephen A. (laughs) Stay (laughs) off the weed. (laughs) I I love it whenever he does that. I mean, it's up there. It's one of his top catchphrases up there with forgetting if Hunter Henry is playing or in a game or not. But (laughs) No, mad respect to Stephen A. He's one of the better ones out there. But seriously, when I look at this wide receiving unit, so obviously Josh Gordon's out, got rid of Demarius Thomas, AB has gone, (laughs) you know, so they had to fix it somewhere. Julian Edelman can really only do so much. They can only piece it together with Philip Dorsett, who was a bust just a couple years ago. We still don't even have Nikhil Harry back, although that's a name to put on your radar here coming up in a couple weeks. Nikhil Harry should be back from injury. It's going to be interesting. I think that Mohamed Sanu definitely was underperforming in the Falcons offense, but when you have Kelvin Ridley and Julio Jones, two premier blue chippers on your roster, of course you're going to be sack and fiddle. Oh, yeah, that's why I think for the Falcons it was a good move because they did have Calvin Ridley, and him and Sanu were kind of trying to battle out for that number two where you'd have two weeks where it was Ridley was the looks like he's taking over. Then they'd go back to Snoo and then it'd flip-flop. But I just remember this. They probably didn't trade a second-round pick for just a receiver. They, pick, they did a second-round pick for a receiver slash quarterback. So now they have another receiver slash quarterback <laughs> on their team, and they can do those trick plays where they throw it out to the outside and you know either Sanu or Edelman's out there, and then they just bomb it 60 yards because they both used to play quarterback. My dream play is to see a flea flicker from Mohamed Sanu to Julian Edelman with Tom Brady running down the seam. It's, it's completely <laughs> possible now. So now they have Tom Brady, their backup quarterback, and two emergency quarterbacks. Oh, yeah, that's right. They even – what's his name? Uh, Berrios, right? Yeah, there you that's go. Crazy. I mean, but I feel like that's just a modern NFL. You need so many players that could do so many different things. So I think there is some merit to picking up a Mohamed Sanu who has that ability to just bomb it out. I'd love to see them do some moves with that. And you know they will. Oh, yeah. They're, they're definitely going to. I'm surprised they didn't roll it out this week. But it'll probably be in the big game plan next week. The last one that we're going to talk about is A.J. Green. Is he or isn't he on the block? You're on a tanking 0-8 team. I saw this stat today on uh, Red Zone. Andy Dalton is the first quarterback to start one season 8-0 and and another season 0-8 in his career. A.J. Green is... Not on contract next year. He's going to be a free agent, but they insist on not trading him. The trade deadline is two days away now. Do you see him moving at this point? Well, the trouble is with the teams we mentioned above him right now, the Patriots and the Niners at both acquiring wide receivers this week, it definitely shrinks his market to the point where it's what teams are still left to go out there and pursue him. Obviously, you hear about the Eagles game thrown around. They have they also have a weird situation going on with the Alshon Jeffrey headline that came out this week, him apparently calling out Carson Wentz in the locker room. And then you also have the Packers, which is a name that's been floated around a little bit as well. Now, obviously, adding him to the Packers with what they already have with Devontae Adams there, that'd be electric, especially – Let's face it, Andy Dalton to Aaron Rodgers is a huge step up in quarterback play for him. It would be huge to see him, but obviously, what shape are we getting A.J. Green back in coming off another injury? He's been very banged up the last couple years, so at this point, north of 30, is A.J. Green the same player we've grown accustomed to? 
I still think he will be. Get him a capable quarterback, especially if he goes to Green Bay. I could see him going back to vintage A.J. Green, even though he's had what one one major injury in his career. He's really been an Ironman looking back. I, I could see him going back to where he was in, in his previous life. Well, that certainly helps so. I definitely do think it – it does work to his advantage. Even if he does arguably have lost a step speed-wise going down the field, he still is a big target, big body nonetheless. So he'll definitely have red zone opportunities. Yeah, so it's going to be you know a fun two days with the hopefully them turning into the NBA where we see some big moves. We've already seen some big moves, you know, Marcus Peters, Jalen Ramsey. So we've already seen some some pretty big trades go down. So these last two days are going to be pretty exciting to kind of go for so let's actually get into some game breakdowns now uh, let's start with that Thursday night game with the best quarterback in the league since he got criticized by the media he has been the absolute best statistical quarterback since that time do you believe in Kirk Cousins I have very vocally said it in episode 13 of the slump with Juju Dre that no I do not believe in Kirk Cousins quite yet come on he faced the Redskins, the Giants, the Detroit Lions, they've lost a step in the past defense. And I just don't think he's really turned the corner in my mind. He, I still want to see him beat competitive teams, and we still haven't seen him be, be able to do that. Now that's coming at it from a real-life perspective. From a fantasy perspective, the guy's been balling out. And there's been a lot of quarterback injuries. There's been a lot of underperformances at that position. So right now you have to strike while the iron's hot and go pick up Kirk Cousins if he's still floating around there. Back next week in another matchup where he can have some decent numbers against Kansas City. Then he plays Dallas and Denver before going into the bye week. Now looking at his end of year schedule, because now we're starting to get to the point where we're talking about what you're looking at with the playoff. He has Detroit, Chargers, Packers. I personally wouldn't love having Kirk Cousins as my playoff quarterback when it came down to it. I do think, even though the Packers have a lot of uh, fantasy points, I do think they are still a tough defense. And in a big game that might be for the division, I don't like the opportunity for having Kirk Cousins as my starter in a championship game. Yeah, and even that game just before with the Chargers, the Chargers' defense against quarterbacks is actually pretty good. The defense against running backs, however, is absolute dog crap. Whoa, 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 whoa. I am talking a lot of trash about Kirk Cousins, man, but he's not Mitch Trubisky. Let's get that straight. No, it doesn't even matter. Like If you go back and look at the record with, or you go back and look at the stats with the quarterbacks, we're a top 10 team against quarterbacks, but we're a bottom five team against running backs. So our run defense is terrible, but our pass defense is actually pretty good. <laughs> I know. I'm just playing. Well, another big note for this game, too, is obviously for Kirk Cousins, production long term he also obviously wants both his main offensive pieces on the field Adam Thielen was out this game with a hamstring I do think that hindered Kirk Cousins a little bit now I do think Thielen would have played had it not been a Thursday night game so I think he'll probably be back by next week's game against KC yeah they get that mini buy as they call it but yeah three-day turnaround is not good for hamstrings that's why when we come up talk about the game that you're going to be playing on Thursday with the Cardinals. They had a running back go down with a hamstring. So three days, especially with hamstrings, those fast, you know, you got to be running a lot. You're putting a lot of torque and everything on your legs. That, that's not too good. But Stefan Diggs definitely, you know, benefited from it. 143 yards. But he did have that fumble. It's his third lost fumble. It's kind of the game he's playing this year where he's up and down and then he'll fumble. So that is a little worrisome when you consider he has an old school head coach and Mike Zimmer. I do think that those type of coaches, when they hear the word fumble, just instantly have the bench button to their side. Uh, I look at any time that a Patriots running back fumbles the ball. We don't see them for weeks. Oh yeah, they're done. I, I feel like Mike Zimmer is still in that kind of vein. And I do think that's a possibility when you consider lost fumbles, even more than picks. Coaches just hate them. Yeah, they just kill drives. Like he was streaking down the field for like 50 yards on that play. Tried to cut back again and just lost it. So if Thielen was playing, he probably would have had less production because they probably would have been, you know, funneling more stuff towards him. But I mean, that's just you're, what you're going to have to play with now. He has the most fumbles for uh, receivers. He has four fumbles with three lost. So that's. Not too good of a stat for him, but on the other side, Dalvin Cook is a man amongst boys right now. He is <laughs> legit. 
Yeah, he's been one of the best running backs in football all year long. I mean, similar to what we said about Christian McCaffrey last time I was on the show, you don't need us to tell you that Christian McCaffrey is a must-start weekly, but Dalvin Cook has established himself amongst the top tier. Now, I will say, watching this game, because for some reason I was possessed enough to watch this game on Thursday, I did notice Alexander Madison is is a manimal himself, too. Oh, yeah, he's he's – ridiculous that's why i've been telling people to handcuff him for the last couple weeks yeah i just saw so two tackles in the row in the fourth quarter and if you watch this game you know what i'm talking about he was just throwing guys off of him he was having a few marshawn lynch type runs that got called back by penalty because yes. that's just what happens to the most amazing runs the best plays remember that deandre hopkins catch last year one handed behind the back etc et yes et and it got called back by penalty. That's just what happens when you have a sweet play. You always have to look for that little yellow flag just laying around the field. Just ruins everything. <laughs> but no, Madison has a decent role in this offense too. It's going to be interesting to see if they do decide to conserve Dalvin Cook, who has an injury history down the stretch. So that if they do make a playoff run, they have both those guys running at full steam. Hard to say, but I mean, still, that doesn't mean don't start Dalvin Cook with confidence each and every week. Oh, yeah, you have to start him. He is second in, I believe, rushing yards. I think third in scrimmage yards. So you have to start this guy. I mean, he's just, he's matchup proof now at this point. So let's get into the Redskins side. There's really not much to get into, just a mm-hmm. couple notes. Uh, we saw Haskins again uh, due to a Case Keenum injury. Uh, he did not fare well. He only had five passes. But Adrian Peterson with 76 yards, sixth all-time now on the rushing list so he's trying to get up there hall of famer yes or no i mean he's definitely hall of famer there's no doubt about that i mean people keep bringing up this frank or hall of famer no if you're in the top five top six rushing you're definitely a hall of famer i yeah, know frank he has Gore at three yeah i know he has some mars on his legacy with you know obviously the child abuse scandal everything like that but still, like, there's no one to dying Adrian Peterson's impact on the game, especially just his one MVP season alone makes him a Hall of Famer. Yeah, being a running back, you just have to go above and beyond to win that. So if you if you have a MVP as a running back, you just automatically. Fun fact, obviously, <laughs> fantasy football show, one of my favorite pickups of all time, I had Adrian Peterson during his amazing 2,000-yard year. Oh my and boy, <laughs> being a draft him or? <laughs> yeah, because he was coming off that ACL, oh, where that's he, right. and he just fell to me in the third round. Oh, also on that team, let's remember, oh yeah, I had Kelvin Johnson with his close to 2,000-yard year. Oh yeah, and I had Drew Brees with 5,000 yards. It was a good year for me. Did you win the championship, <laughs> though? Yes, I did. Hey, there you go. And now I'm in a seven-year championship draft, so. Well, hopefully you can get it this year. <laughs> um, but on the last note of this game... In that Geis, week. Darius Geis, they're hoping to get him back. He's hopefully going to be practicing either this week or next week and then be activated off of IR. It'll be interesting to see how they use him. Do they try to rush him back or do they just save him for next year because they're obviously in tank mode as well. So, I mean, if he's practicing, he's playing. There's no doubt about that in my mind. It's just going to be – I think you have to temper your expectations with this pick. With that said, I still think that Darius Geis is worth an add if he's still floating around your league's waiver wire because you're going to see a lot of weird names pop up over the next few weeks when it comes to injuries at the running back position. And I'd much rather trust a guy of the pedigree of Darius Geis than we're going to talk about like a Zach Zenner here in a minute because (laughs) of the Cardinals situation. So I do think that it's worth it to add names like Darius Geis, who at least we've seen him be a productive runner in like the preseason and we've also seen him produce at the collegiate level there he's guys i'd add him especially if your league has an ir spot and you could afford to keep him around for a couple weeks even if in a dynasty league you could probably pick him up and not even have to waste one of those top picks and then just run with a starting running back into your next season for a 15 or 14 round pick so Mm -hmm. I think he went in ninth or 10th round this year was about his ADP. So, I mean, if you can get a person off of waivers and run him into next year on just a flyer for dynasty leagues. I mean, at a certain point you're asking yourself, do I really need that backup quarterback? Do I really need that backup tight end? I'd much rather. Especially after all the buys, you you should be fine quarterback wise. Yeah. So you're streaming. 
So you're just going to need add guys with the highest potential upside, especially highest potential upside in weeks 14 through 16, because that's going to win you your league. Yeah, that that's that's ultimately the goal of you know picking up these flyer guys is for those playoff pushes, help you win those games late in the year when everybody's injured. You're down to just the top teams in the league. You want to have that slight edge going forward. So let, let's get down now into the Sunday games. Seattle at now tank mode, Atlanta. <laughs> Seattle pulled this one out 27-20. Russell Wilson didn't really have to do much. They were gifted short fields and missed field goals pretty much all game. Only had 182, but he still had two touchdowns. So, I mean, he's going to have multiple touchdowns every week. DK Metcalf, though, this guy is pretty much constant. I mean, he's getting about three to five catches a game. But this one, he turned the three catches into two touchdowns. So, the yeah. bench, you know, had two touchdowns. because eh, I've seen a lot of people start him, especially as a flex option. And in, in deeper leagues, he's been more or less a wide receiver, too. Because he's going to get you touchdowns. I mean, it's basically like he, he's flip-flopped roles with Tyler Lockett, where he's more Tyler Lockett's role now. And Tyler Lockett is playing that Doug Baldwin type. Yeah, 20 to 20, and then now DK's just getting all the touchdowns. I think DK's also getting a lot of looks in the red zone now that uh, Disley's out as well. I've seen his red zone targets shoot up since that Will Disley. I mean, why not? The guy's a physical freak. If you can find him in the end zone, throw it up. He's probably going to come down with it because who's going to beat him in a one-on-one fight for the ball? Yeah, that guy is – if you didn't see that picture, I don't know what you're living under, but but one (laughs) point – 1.6% 1.6% body fat or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I do think that's a little bit of a farce because when you look at some professional bodybuilders who are 1.6, they look vastly different than he does. But I, I still, the guy's in better shape than I can even hope to ever imagine in my life. Yeah, I, I think he was, even in our best shapes when we were wrestling, he's still a million times better than what we were. <laughs> right? What was your best 40? My best 40 was probably like, Four or seven or something like that. Four seven. Okay. A lot better than me. I think mine was 5.25 peak. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, for white guys, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, I mean, but I'm a Mexican man. Maybe I could have gotten in the broad jump. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris Carson had a, another good game, 90 yards and a touchdown. Julio Jones did not miss Matt Ryan because he saw 10 catches, 152. Matt Schaub, depending on the health of Matt Ryan, could look like a, a decent streamer. He had 460 yards and a touchdown. And you know, depending on that ankle, mm-hmm. you know, that's a it's a really good streaming number right there, at least, especially bonus wise for yardage. Yeah. I mean, you, you said on your last pod, like, who would have thought Matt Schaub's still in the league? This was his first start since 2015 when he played for Baltimore. And the last time I believe he started for the Falcons was like 2005, I want to say I saw the stat. Yeah, that was ridiculous. Now, the thing about that when I look at it, it's just a matter of the differences between the real life game and fantasy football. In fantasy football, there is tons of value in garbage time, and don't let anyone tell you anything different. Because that's look at Matt Ryan. Yeah, look at Matt Ryan, look at Matt Shaw. Basically, this Falcons offense is going to generate points for your fantasy team, but if you're an actual Falcons fan, I'm sorry, but it doesn't look like you're going to be able to rise up this year. Yeah, no, they're, they're done. Uh, Dan Quinn's probably going to get fired at the end of the year. And then you're in an interesting situation. Do you blow up the whole team and start over, or mm. do you try to just reload it? No, I don't think you do that, because at the end of the day, you still have your franchise quarterback, which is more than a lot of these other teams that are t- actively tanking or blowing up things do have. I think the major piece that's missing for this team is, let's face it, Dan Quinn is more is a defensive mind himself, defensive head coach. And when Matt Ryan was obviously at his best, it was with offensive coordinator Kyle Shanahan on board. So I do think that maybe this team just needs that spark offensively to get them back on the right track. Even if they're playing poor defensively, and listen, I thought the Big 12 only played on Saturdays, but this defense definitely brings that into question for me. Oh, yeah. Big 12 is all offense, no defense. So with that said, might as well bring in a Big 12 coach. I'm looking at you, Lincoln Riley. Hey, that that would be pretty interesting. I, I would like that. I mean, he could he'd bring that air raid. You have two awesome receivers. You got an awesome tight end right now. You do have a really good running back, even though statistically this year, fantasy this year, he's not doing too hot. 
but that's more of game script because they lost their receiving back in Tevin Coleman. Yeah. So. From the real-life perspective, the Falcons are porous, but at the same time, you can't hate on these numbers if you're a fantasy owner. No, no. you got to love them. Julio Jones is still a must-start, especially with that name. He's just Julio. I mean, he's going to get his catches. He's going to manhandle people. Um, He's going to have 1,500 yards with three touchdowns again, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, no touchdowns in this one, and he did have that long touchdown streak, but every now and then he'll just have one of those games where you look up and, oh, I'm facing Julio Jones, and he has 40, 50 points on me. Yeah. This is not looking good for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to lose because of freaking Julio Jones. Let's just kind of breeze through this next game because it was was absolutely terrible. This is coming (laughs) from a fan. It it was god-awful to watch. Chargers shooting themselves in the foot, Bears shooting themselves in the foot. It was a game of let's see who can lose instead of let's see who could win. Yeah, um, I was saying it in the pre-show, usually it's your team that finds ways to lose on a game-winning kick at the end. And, hey, fortune favors the Chargers in this situation. Yeah, finally, we were on the opposite side of down by one score, having to go the length of the field and score to win. We were on the opposite side of we were up one score and trying to keep the team from scoring. So, hey, it's a change up and I'm happy. Hopefully we can actually win a game. You know, so far it's eight weeks in and it's been one game, Miami, that hasn't been a one score game. So we're, we're kings of the one score games, I guess. You know, playing in time. I mean, if you're going off Vegas lines, that's just fine. But as far as this game itself, I mean, you're right. There isn't a ton to really go over. I think the biggest thing that stood out to me was David Montgomery finally had his breakout game. But, you know, it's more of a product of volume, I feel. 27 carries, 135 yards, a touchdown. When you're touching the ball 27 times, I expect you to break that 100-yard mark yeah, that he has failed almost- to impossible not to break that 100 yard with 20 cat 20 carries the other thing is keenan allen still has that touchdownless streak he had a touchdown in his hands and just dropped it which is very un keenan allen like so look for him he's i mean still on a pitch count he played i believe 60 percent of the plays instead of like 90 percent of the plays so he, he was on the pitch count but he still had 10 targets in 60 snap or 60 percent of the snaps so his volume is there he's still a must start unless you know just the matchup is extremely daunting both running backs still got a touchdown Eckler and Melvin Gordon uh, Melvin Gordon again only 30 yards uh, saved his day with a touchdown again so that's very good for him. Uh, for some reason, though, Eckler did not get any work. He only had like six touches in this whole game, which baffles me because the offense is better with Eckler on the field and not Melvin Gordon. Well, I think you just got to give some credence to the Bears defense at a certain point. I did want to go back to Keenan Allen a little bit here. Obviously, he's gained plenty of targets, plenty of receptions, which is great if you're in a PPR league, but we're at the point where if you're in a standard league, would you say Keenan Allen is honestly benchable? Oh, yeah. Standard, he's definitely benchable unless you're in a deep league where he's you know, a really good flex option. But he's PPR gold, just like James White, just like Austin Eckler. But standard-wise, he's never been a, a very, very good standard player. He's always been a better PBR player. Well, he is what he's gained falling into the end zone. But when I, I'm looking at his game log right now, 53, uh, seven catches for 53 yards today. Four catches for 61, two for 33, four for 18, and five for 48. This is following his 13-catch, 183-yard, two-touchdown performance against the Texans. So he's in a little bit of a slump. Now, you know there is one thing that we love to do, bust the slump. Now, I do think – so Keenan Allen, if you're listening to this, we're talking shit about you. We're bringing your legacy into the question. Now, this is the time that all professional athletes – Band together to prove Juju wrong. So prove me wrong, Keenan Allen. Prove him wrong. I still love you, Slayer. <laughs> no. um, but at this point, you know, Mitch Trubisky is absolutely terrible. Would you start even Allen Robinson on this team now? I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, this Bears offense, I think you do have to just consider David. If David Montgomery is going to get this kind of work consistently, if he gets this amount of carries, He's going to be a vol- very volume-based play. He's just going to get so many touches that you're just going to have to put him in your starting lineup 
regardless, you're not going to be happy about it. And his ceiling is definitely going to be capped, but he's definitely a must start as far as a running back two option, low end running back two, but still in that mix. Now, as far as Tariq Cohen, we were saying it a couple weeks ago, he's pretty much a cut him. I, I would just cut bait at this point. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's following a nine catch 19 yard game. Like, yeah. I mean, especially, too, like we were just talking about the difference between standard and PPR. You should have cut him weeks ago if you're in a standard league, but if you're in a PPR league, it's even at that point where he's just clogging up space on your roster. Allen Robinson, yeah, he's pretty much the only ones that's still been productive in this offense, and even he is very inconsistent, but that just goes in line with the poor quarterback play. I saw this tweet out there today, and I do think that it does have some merit. If Mitch Trubisky wasn't drafted number two. Let's say he was drafted in the second round as opposed to number two. He'd probably be on the bench right now. Oh, yeah. But if you want to go with that stat, that same draft class behind him, Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. Now imagine one of those two quarterbacks with Matt Nagy and that defense. Yeah. Do you give any thought to the Cam Newton rumors? I don't really buy it. I don't think they're going to trade Cam this season. I don't think they'll trade him. Yeah, especially but not by Tuesday because they're still not sold. They're still not sold on Kyle Allen, and rightfully so. We'll get into that game here. But I just I do think that that still is controversy in the sense where do you kind of input Cam at this point? Okay, I made my piece with this game. Not a lot of fantasy noteworthy in this particular time window. No, and the only thing I'll have to add for this game is running backs going against the Chargers. You, you kind of have to play them. Their Chargers are giving up 130 on the ground every week. So even next week with Jamal Williams and Adam Jones, like that duo is going to run all over us. So wait, Adam Jones moved from playing center field for the Baltimore Orioles. What the heck is his name? Then? Adam. <laughs> Aaron. Aaron. There you go. Aaron Jones. Come on, dude. Our executive producer was classmates with him in high school. You should know this. Aaron Jones is a lo- much cherished and loved player by the Slump Buster Media family. Uh, not me because I'm playing against him this week. Well, that, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. So next game, Giants at the Lions. Giants 26, Detroit 31. Uh, Matthew Stafford had a Matthew Stafford game. 342, three touchdowns, one interception. That's pretty much what you're going to get from him week in and week out. However... The running game, which the number one person added on the waiver this week, Ty Johnson, didn't even get the most carries in this game. Have you ever heard of Tra Trey or Tra Carson? No, I haven't. (laughs) Is it it Trey or Tra? I think it's Trey. But, you know, I haven't heard about him, but I have heard about Paul Perkins. And when I did, I wasn't impressed back then. I'm not impressed now. With carry on out, there's just no one on this backfield you want to own. It's a net backfield. They're going to go back to the, where the Lions were a couple of years ago, just airing it out and hoping that they can outpace teams because they're not going to have any ground game. If I was them, I would consider blowing up Garrett Blunt's phone a little bit. I would consider, I think CJ Anderson's still out there, maybe even giving him a call to bring him back. Well, but, s- s- some running backs that are still on the trade market right now, Rashad Penny and uh, Kenyon Drake. I have heard his name floated around a little bit. I think I heard him connected with the tight ends, but this would be a situation if you're the Lions and you still think you have an outside chance of contending, maybe you look into that option. Basically, there's no one worth owning right now out of this backfield, even worth picking up on waivers. Yeah, receiver-wise, it's it's just Galladay because everybody else behind him is, is pretty inconsistent. You have Marvin Jones, four touchdowns last week, 20 yards this week. Like, well, I, I will say Amendola uh, is oh yeah, Amendola PPR wise is yeah. I think this is a second straight week of like eight catches. Eight catches last week, one hundred five. This week, ninety. So I mean, PPR wise, Amendola he's kind of filling in that Golden Tate role for Stafford now. So yeah, he, he's going to have that volume there because they're going to air rate it out. So Galladay and Amendola really the only two. And I think. So you mentioned Cameron Brait was the king of almost touchdowns. TJ Hawkinson definitely has supplanted him in that role. I feel like every week I see TJ Hawkinson drop a touchdown or come one yard shy. Yeah, poor guy. But on the Giants side, though, I mean, did you see that Saquon Barkley run where he manhandled three (laughs) guys? He stiff-armed one dude into the ground and then literally drug him from one side of his body to the other side of his body so he can get around him. 
Here's Honda what, did that man good. <laughs> he's looking like a superhero, that's for sure. Now, <laughs> that's what I will say. As fun as all these air roid offenses are, all these throw it 50 times a game offenses are to see, a good, powerful run just sticks in your mind so much more as a football fan. I was talking about Alexander Madison just manhandling guys earlier. When you see just Saquon Barkley just – embarrassing another man on national TV. Literally man, burying his face into the ground. That man has a family. <laughs> Saquon don't care. He has a family, Eris. <laughs> Saquon don't care. But Danny Dimes is back. Yeah, three, he, earned, he earned his nickname back. 322, four touchdowns. Danny Dimes is back. <laughs> or maybe the Lions pass defense has regressed quite a bit. How long is he going to be back for? They play <laughs> the Cowboys next week, so... He's going to be back until that game kicks off next week. Now, Golden Tate in his return game to Detroit, eight catches, 85 yards. I liked that from a PPR perspective, and I think Golden Tate definitely is a good presence to have in that locker room, a good veteran for a Daniel Jones, a rookie to have. And going to develop into a safety blanket for Daniel Jones. Develop into a safety blanket. And now, I think that we actually do start, have to start looking at Darius Slayton. He had a couple touchdowns in this game. He's been one of Danny Dimes' go-tos in the passing game, and I think he's definitely a worthwhile waiver wire pickup, especially while Sterling Shepard is still out. Yeah, two catches, two touchdowns. You can't really, you know, fault that guy. But the reason why he's so good with Danny Dimes is because at the start of the season, when he was the backup, none other starters wanted to play with him. So guess what? other rookies have to go play catch with him. So he builds a rapport with the younger guys, gets thrust into the starting role, and then he doesn't have rapport with those starting guys. Starting guys are out. Now the rookies come up. Bam, he has all the rapport in the world now. Yeah. I, Evan Ingram caught a touchdown this week too. You like to see that, especially on a national tight end day. Okay. Glad you mentioned that. I saw on NFL's Instagram page that they were giving an honorary tight end position to – Taysom Hill how do we feel about that <laughs> he's not a tight end he's a quarterback do you do you like him as a tight end do not uh Taysom Hill can be anything you want him to be for the right price <laughs> that guy is all over the field he had his first receiving touchdown just ridiculous like uh... <laughs> I, I kind of want to craft this bit out a little bit more I just see like Taysom Hill going to like Sean Payton and rolled down cars like what do you do I do whatever you want me to do, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Just at the draft, his draft meeting was like, all right, so what can you do? Well, Sean, what would you like me to do for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need to see a minimum rookie salary up front and we'll discuss a four-year deal later. <laughs> yeah, it, It's just, he's all over the place. But let's go from that game to our London. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do the London accents. The London <laughs> game. Bengals, I mean, poor Bengals. They only scored 10, Rams 24. This was more like Bengals versus Cooper Cup because mm -hmm. Cooper Cup had his way with that secondary. Is it safe to say this is the worst thing we've done to London since 1776? Um, yeah. <laughs> We're just not going to go back there ever again. Mixon has definitely been dropped in pretty much every league. If you're still holding on to Mixon, my question is why. But 66 yards, 11 receiving, one touchdown. But he's just been so inept, you know, I mean, going forward. Bro, you know, he, he's 94% owned. He's not, not dropped, but he's definitely been on most people's benches, just kind of lingering. It's tough to start him because you just really don't know what spots really work for him. He was not a starting option for me this week at all. I didn't even consider it, and this was arguably one of his best weeks. Yeah, poor guy who's drafted to be your number one running back, and he's not even being started now. But like we said, Cooper Cup, seven catches, 220 yards, one touchdown on a beautiful flea flicker, which was a, like <laughs> 17 reverse flea flicker, which was awesome to see. Gurley had his touchdown, 44 yards. He's still in that 10 t touches range, so – you know, it's still a little worrisome for your lead back. Right now, he's probably not your lead back. He's more like your you know, RB2, maybe RB3 at this point. Brandon Cooks, though, I hate to say this, but I think he might be done in the NFL. He's left the game with another concussion. He's trending towards that you know, Jordan Reed where every time he plays, he gets a concussion. 
maybe you should think about retiring. Yeah, but it, it's crazy, though, his concussions. He just gets laid out on these ridiculous hits. Like, I go back to that Super Bowl hit and just like, wow, you know, like you just don't see too many guys just take those over the middle shots like he does. Now, so speaking of Brandon Cooks in that vein, Josh Reynolds got some work in this game, three receptions, 73 yards, and a touchdown. Josh Reynolds is a name definitely to consider on waivers this week. It's kind of, again, it's another week where the waiver wire is a little light. And when I look at what he did last year when Cooper Cup went down, he definitely had a role in this offense. Uh, it's definitely someone that Jared Goff is used to working with. Fire him up in Brandon Cook's spot, potentially. Yeah. Uh, it's just I hate to see you know guys go out with concussions, but, I mean, poor guy. I, I do see Robert Woods stepping up a little bit more as well, even though I don't know how much more Robert Woods can step up. He's been a mid-range wide receiver, too, this entire year. He hasn't really had that wide receiver one performance like he was putting up last year. And I do think with Brandon Cooks out, that is definitely going to put him into that high-end wide receiver two, low-end wide receiver one range, potentially. Yeah. I mean, really, this offense can do so much that almost all of you guys you kind of have to start, especially Cooper Cup, where Cooper mm. Cup now is, unless he's out, you have to start him, even – if he's mm. probably just a little banged up because I mean, heck I think he, with that 220 yard game, he's probably going to be in the lead again for receiving. Yeah. Yards. I think when you look at legitimately the wide receiver position and you look at who has the highest floor, Cooper cup has the highest floor amongst the wide receiver position. I think right now he just gets so many targets in a given game and he's doing stuff with these targets. He's not just your standard slot receiver where they catch a 10 yards down the field to get tackled or wrapped up. No, he's been able to take these plays to the house. He's definitely someone that Goff looks for in the red zone. He's a high-end wide receiver one. He's competing for the number one wide receiver slot in fantasy this year. Oh, yeah. We always throw that word around, but safety blanket is a huge thing, especially for younger quarterbacks. When they have somebody that they can rely on when a play breaks down, they know where that guy's going to be at. They know they can trust him, ergo, Cooper Cup in this offense. So, you know, look at Jason Witten with Tony Romo. Mm -hmm. it's needed uh, every offense needs someone that you can rely on to keep things going especially when you just think like when it comes to sustaining drives and you have a tough third and six a guy like cooper cup that's exactly the guy that you need to be able to look for oh yeah he he's awesome definitely start him going forward with confidence todd Gurley, depending on the matchup depending on the run defense but like juju said josh reynolds Take a look at him. I could also see Everett being floated around as well, their tight end. I could see him getting a little bit more work, especially on National Tight End Day. He might be a, a decent person to, to look in, especially with some, some more buys coming up. I could see him, if Brandon Cooks is out for an extended period of time, to kind of go forward as well. So let's go from that London game to the Saints and the Cardinals. Cardinals lost this one 9-31. to 31. Drew Brees, did you say start Drew Brees or would you have sat Drew Brees? You have the bye week coming up next week. Are you saying if I'm the Saints or are you saying from fantasy? No, if if Drew Brees plays, you have to play him. I was talking about if you ran the Saints, would you have rushed him back one week before the bye? Not against the Cardinals right before the bye. If I was playing the Panthers or the – a box or someone in the division, I would have considered it or someone like, you know, they're competing with for playoff seating, but the Cardinals, nah, and unless you just had the mindset that this is the type of game that Breeze can coast a little bit through. Yeah. Kind of get his feet wet, I guess. Yeah. But I, I don't think I would have necessarily took the risk, but then again, if he felt healthy enough to play, who am I to tell a guy to sit out? Honestly, do I really want to see healthy players sitting on the bench just because they can? I think that's kind of why I veer away from the NBA in certain respects. I think that the NFL is a tough guy sport, and if you can play, you play. Well, he did play. 373 through the air, three touchdowns. Alvin Kamara was out again. He gets the bye week to get healthy, but Latavius Murray has killed it with him out. <laughs> 21 carries, 102 yards, one touchdown, nine, car nine catches, 55 yards, and another touchdown. That's his second back-to-back -back multiple touchdown game. Mm -hmm. Michael I, Thomas didn't really miss his quarterback because he still put up these numbers but with him back he had 11 catches 112 yards and a touchdown so you like to see that from right now the number one guy in fantasy for receivers I mean especially after the bye 
I mean, Kamara is a, a must start. Mm-hmm. Mike Thomas is a must start. Breeze is a must start. But I do definitely think if you're the Saints and you're looking at what T- Latavius Murray is doing, you do consider fully inserting him into that Mark Ingram slot. Oh, yeah, I definitely year. would. Yeah. So from a game planning perspective, we have to kind of like think about how that was to be a fantasy owner and have both those guys in the backfield last year, Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara. Two years ago, they both finished as top running back ones, respectively. I think they were both four and five in some leaked rankings. Last year, so Mark Ingram had the suspension. He was coming back a little bit slow, and it did seem like they had a bit of a slow going because they kept trying to integrate him into the offense. I do kind of feel that's how Latavius Murray's insertion into this offense went in the season's early going. And now that we've seen Latavius Murray in the full, I think that Sean Payton, especially if you want to ease up on Alvin Kamara's ankle, you're going to consider splitting these guys' carries. And I am impressed what Latavius Murray has been able to do from a pass-catching perspective. Nine receptions? He throughout his career hasn't been really known as a pass catching running back so now that he's added that element to his game he can definitely be a big part of the Saints offense moving forward and I would even consider him either high end flex or a low end running back too yeah that I mean in Minnesota he lost all of his work to Jarek McKinnon who's now on the IR slot for you so just imagine that backfield with all those guys that you guys have and Jarek McKinnon that would just be ridiculous (laughs) off off of ridiculous but yeah he was never that receiving back and I still don't think he'll get a lot of receiving work with Camaro back he might get you know three or four opportunities out of the backfield he was not going to get nine but you know definitely flex him going forward too you're going to see formations where both of these guys are on the field that's definitely what something that Sean Payton will be able to utilize at his disposal yeah and then let's get into the Cardinals so I'm pretty much going to be staying away now for this whole offense, especially in the next three weeks where they play you guys twice. You know, that's not too good. David Johnson is out. Kyler Murray has been severely up and down. He had 220 pass yards today. No touchdowns, no interceptions. Last week he had 104 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. So as a quarterback, two weeks in a row with no touchdowns is not what you like. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're in a two-quarterback league, I can see it or something like that. But otherwise, why even bother with anybody? (laughs) Yeah, that definitely is a little bit tough. As far as Kyler Murray, he definitely does have some upside as a week-to-week play. However, you are right. Niners, the next two out of the next three weeks, he does have the Bucks inserted in that middle there. So maybe you're talking about him more as a streamer if anyone's dropping him after what at least I'm hoping is a bad performance against the Niners. Now, (laughs) I'm a believer in you guys now. So yeah, I think that's an option. But then he has his bye week, the Rams, the Steelers, two tough pass defenses, then the Browns in Seattle. So it does ease up when you consider when you're looking for, again, a quarterback in those championship rounds. Maybe you could find Kyler Murray out there on waivers. Yeah, maybe. I, I would wait to see, though. I would. I mean, heck, if you drop him, you could probably pick him back up in you know, four weeks. I don't think anybody's going to be rushing to pick him up. Yeah, especially since, again, he's going to be faded a little bit because of the matchups the next few weeks at least. And then also he's not going to have any of his running backs. David Johnson's already ruled out. Chase Edmonds left with a hamstring injury. Three days for a hamstring to heal is not ideal. And then, yes, Zach Zenner is back. <laughs> one of those guys for the Lions that where they just aerated and oh yeah we have a running back let's give him the ball once yeah there is no one in that backfield worth picking up right now I mean Christian Kirk led this team in rushing with 19 yards and if you didn't know if you're not an avid follower of the Arizona Cardinals Christian Kirk is a wide receiver yeah (laughs) so there's not much here. I do think that maybe they might just pick up someone off the scrap heap because if both their top two guys are injured and hamstrings take a while. So if he has a hamstring, he's not going to make it out for Thursday night football. David Johnson, if he's as banged up as he's been said to be, he almost played this week, but do you really want to throw him against this Niners run defense right now? Probably not. I think well, they even said that he might not even play for Thursday night either. So yeah, it's just such a quick turnaround for both these guys that's a matchup where you're just not starting any of these guys. You're right. There's not really much upside in the Cardinals offense, at least in the next few weeks. I might consider it. Call me again in week 15. We'll have you back for week 15 then. (laughs) 
All right, but next game is your game. Mm-hmm. Are you guys for real? I, I believe so at this point. I mean, if you don't have them as your number one team after this performance. <laughs> I think it's kind of we're boxed in the corner where it's kind of hard to push them over New England just because points differential-wise, New England still is the best team in the league right now. But they haven't played anybody. They haven't played anybody, but one, by the same – One winning team. By the same token, you can only beat the teams that are scheduled in front of you, and they haven't lost yet. It, it's Right now, the power rankings are very college football-esque. I know LSU just jumped up to number one right now, but if this continues, eventually the Niners will rise up to the top. I'm a little more hesitant than probably even Andre to do it just because you know, I don't want to – I Don't, don't want to jinx him. I don't, well, that <laughs> – I'm not superstitious, but I'm a little stitious. Pat McAfee. Uh, well, another I'm office. Actually, I'll say that. That's where uh, I heard it from. Another office reference. Honestly, two office references in the same show. Uh, actually, this is going to offend a lot of people. <laughs> I haven't really watched The Office. You're fine. No, I only. I hope it. that doesn't kill our show, but. I think it would. I think I'm just here. People clicking that unsubscribe <laughs> button right now. I know my sister's always. Like, you need to watch it. You need to watch it. I'm like, I have so much crap I got to watch and catch up on already. I can't <laughs> add another show right now. I mean, you're doing so – I mean, if anyone asks, you're doing so much hard work right now on our fantasy football show. So. Yeah, I mean, sure am. I'm just sitting and talking. <laughs> but uh, Christian um, McCaffrey yeah. with this one, is he matchup proof now outside of the Bucks? Here's the thing. From watching this game – if it wasn't for his one big touchdown run, it would have been a pretty average day. Yeah, 40-yard touchdown. Yeah, and I do think that was just the Niners eased up a little bit because at that point it was already a 31-13 to 13 game or a 31-7 to 7 game. It was, it was already a blowout by the time he actually was able to break loose, and I do think it's easier for a defense to get a little bit more lax at that point. Now, matchup proof. Probably, because I think the Panthers' remaining schedule doesn't even really have a run defense that you're really scared of, particularly. I will say that when they get into the point where they are facing the Saints, watch out for that matchup. The Saints are no joke as far as a run D. And I do think that a lot of people kind of underrate them because they have this image in their head as the Saints is a bad defense. No, no joke. Run always defense been. Wise, yeah, no joke. Run defense-wise, they are one of the better teams. So he has to face them. Well, actually once. I think believe his last game is against the Saints. So thankfully, unless you're in a league that plays in Week 17, because there's a few of you maniacs out there. That's so weird that leaks to that. I just <laughs> I mean, we could, we could have a whole discussion just on that concept. But <laughs> with that said, yeah, you, you do have to face the Saints one more time. Seattle's in there. Indy both have run good, decent run defenses. But we're talking about the Falcons twice. <laughs> God, is he going to put up 50 points in each of those games? I really, I really hope so. I really hope so. And, but... he fa- and he faces the Redskins. So he does have some good matchups down the stretch run. Yeah, McCaffrey just – he's a stud. I mean, and he touches the ball 50% of the time to where when pe- people talk about the MVP conversation as a whole, he's legitimately in that discussion because the big argument for why quarterbacks are always winning the MVP is – the quarterback position, you can say, touches the ball 100% of the time, or at least 99.9% of the time if you take out the occasional wildcat. Yeah, if the, if we go based off of touching the ball, the centers would be every year. <laughs> well, if you talk to some football PRs, they will say, no, every year the offensive line should win the MVP. There are a few of those people out there. So I, I heard um, when I was listening to Pat McAfee, they were interviewing um, – AQ Shipley, where they said that if Aaron Donald is the best defend or if the best person in the league, what does it say about me who has to do everything he does but running backwards? It's true, but we're getting we're getting sidetracked here. <laughs> let's let's get into the game. I know it's a blowout, so there isn't a lot to take away from these two teams playing each other. But I think we're at the point where this backfield needs a name, and I think the one name that stands out to me: Speed Kills. Because Tevin Coleman, Matt They're Breida, all fast as hell. these guys are one of the quickest running back groups in the league. They can all average over 20 miles per hour when they get into the full sprint. And Coleman, it was like you were hitting the fast forward button when you were watching him run. It was so, ridiculous. So let's talk about his day. 
three rushing touchdowns, one receiving on a little bit of screen that just, <laughs> it broke. I got to say, Kyle Shanahan, he legitimately is one of the best offensive play callers in the league because what you're seeing him do with the running game is equivalent to what you see the Chiefs do passing the ball. Coach of the year at this point. I mean, I mean, you just see these holes open up and the way these running backs are able to hit them with such a burst of speed, it's almost impossible to stop them when they get into full sprint. I mean, even when your fourth string running back in AKA the vulture, Jeff Wilson, you know, has three rushing touchdowns, you know, you're doing something right. And we four do have, string. Yeah. And we do kind of have to talk about that because Matt Breda did leave this game with the ankle injury. Now, Tevin Coleman, you're pretty much considering him right now as a running back one option, I think, at this point. But behind him, Raheem Mostert came in, nine carries for 60 yards. Jeff Wilson did see some mop-up duty at the end. So those are two names that are back on the waiver wire. Generally, you do want to stay away from running backs by committee, but this is a committee you want to be involved in in some way, somehow, because I would feel comfortable putting Raheem Mostert as a flex if Breda can't start, and I would consider throwing out Jeff Wilson as a desperation play for maybe if he lands in the end zone for you. Yeah. That's why we started calling him the vulture because one game he had three carries for three touchdowns. Yeah. I mean, that's all you're hoping for with him. Uh, Obviously their next opponent kind of a lighter defense when you consider the Cardinals. Yeah. And at this point, you know, Jimmy G just needs to manage the game. You know, usually it's a negative connotation with that name, but when you have, arguably the best running game behind you why would you need to do a lot yeah and he he does seem like he's making better throws every now and then jimmy g is going to just have a knucklehead type interception like a wtf interception like he did with luke keekley today but right to him threw right to him but i i mentioned that even when we were doing the season previews he has a little tony romo in him and i think that's undeniable I think, it, to be frank and honest with you guys from a fantasy football perspective, you can cut bait on Jimmy G. He's a very matchup-based starter, and there's not even a lot of great matchups that I feel comfortable throwing him in towards this stretch run of the year. The only one I'm eyeballing is the Atlanta matchup that's still on their schedule but and the Cardinals games. But we play the Saints, the Rams, the Seahawks, a lot of tough pass defenses that I don't expect him to break that 20-point threshold. So you can safely release Jimmy G if you haven't already. As far as, so we mentioned him earlier, Emmanuel Sanders had his first action. I wasn't sure how much reps he was really going to get in this game. Four catches, 25 yards. He scored a touchdown on the Niners opening drive. I do think that Jimmy was looking for him on pivotal third down situations. And I do think that's why he brought, they brought him into this offense. Expect Emmanuel Sanders to jump up potentially. I don't think he's going to be necessarily what he was looked at in Denver, to be honest. So no, strong flex option. Strong flex option because that's the only role I really see him playing. And even at that point, again, this team relies so much on the running game that it's going to be very inconsistent, to be honest. Yeah. So let's just go into the next game because we could break down your team. We could break down my team for a whole show because we're – so invested into those so that's just <laughs> oh i do want to let's one second though we got to look at george kittle's stat line just because it is national tight end day and he is the poster child it wasn't the greatest but i do think it we should mention his it. canadian accent is spot on <laughs> we need to call him dude he i love george kittle <laughs> have you seen like the new great iron heights episode where there's like the scene where they have all the three like former new england quarterbacks and tom brady jimmy g and like brissette hanging out and Tom Brady's like, he even has a Gronk. And that's legitimately what Kittle is right now. Like that personality, he's kind of similar. But six go look it up. Six catches, 86 yards. So, you know, not a huge day. I just felt that it was something to mention just because, again, George Kittle was the one that started this national tight end day. And good for him. But uh, Eagles went up to Buffalo in a terrible weather game and just decided to run the ball the whole game. I mean, the running game, it – it's effective. It's yeah. a tried and true strategy. Jordan Howard, 23 carries, 96 yards, and a touchdown. Miles Sanders, three carries, 74 yards. First rushing touchdown, three catches for 44, but he did leave the game injured. I still haven't seen anything port-wise on what it was or 
you know, what the severity of it is. If he sits out, though, you, know, you kind of have to think about starting Jordan Howard next week because he's not going to be splitting carries anymore. He's going to get the, the lion's share of them. Yeah, I do think you're just considering Jordan Howard. With Miles Sanders in, he's a high-end flex, low-end running back, too. With Sanders out, you consider pushing him into that high end middle of the rank, or sorry, middle of the pack running back twos. Because at the end of the day, Jordan Howard, and this has haunted him his entire career, he's not involved much in the passing game. That's definitely where Sanders was able to step in. So, with that said, if Sanders is out, you're going to see like Darren Sproles get some work on third down situations. And that's going to definitely take away from Jordan Howard's fantasy value. Yeah, but I still think carry-wise, though, you know, he's not going to be giving up seven carries a game, eight carries a game to Sanders. So he's going to get those opportunities even more. So. Well, he's going to get the goal line work. and It's already getting the goal line work. So And goal line work is what matters. I love goal line work. <laughs> That's Hence the vulture. You, you could win an entire fantasy title just on goal line work. Yeah, but let's get into the tight ends now. Zach Ertz, as high as you were – going to draft him he still only has one touchdown he's yet to break 100 yards two catches for 20 yards this week second week in a row where philly threw a touchdown to the tight end position however it was to dallas goddard not zach Ertz. so at this point Mm -hmm. i mean you kind of still have to start him just because you know tight end position is so wishy-washy if there's not somebody else that you could pick up and start and stream or maybe even even look into Dallas Goddard, but even Dallas Goddard only had two catches for 22 yards and touchdown. Maybe, and here's something to consider. So we've been talking constantly about the NFL trade deadline. Most leagues, fantasy football trade deadline is coming up as well. Now, Zach Ertz, this is going to be an interesting point. Does he still have the name cachet to potentially move off of him? The main point is you have to trust yourself as a fantasy owner to be able to pick up a proper replacement at that tight end position. Yeah, it, it, I still think you could probably swindle him for like one of those people that, you know, every league has those couple of people that don't necessarily, you know, they're not fully invested. They hear, and they, oh, I, I know who Zach Ertz is. Yeah, let's, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure you can offload him there. But like Juju said, you do have to make sure you have a viable replacement for him because if you don't and you're trading away a tight end and you're picking up some insert name here guy okay so i mean it's not like you're starting tyler higby over zach Ertz. you know you still want to have someone that you could reasonably slot in i look at guys like a darren fells who's still only 18 percent owned right now and i consider that but it's just it's a product of the position you're kind of pigeonholed into keeping zach Ertz, unfortunately but it's something to consider especially if you were one of the owners that did, and I don't necessarily advise the strategy myself, but did invest in two high-end tight ends. I have seen plenty of owners get away with carrying two tight ends on their roster. If you are one of those guys, maybe that's something to consider. If you can still pick up a valuable piece on your league's trade market. Yeah, I have two tight ends in two leagues right now. I have Kittle and Kelsey in one, and Hunter Henry and Ertz in another. So, I mean, that's interesting. <laughs> I, I, I can get away with trading one of them. So, but Buffalo wise, the only person you can rely on is Josh Allen yeah. as a streamer. I mean, receiver wise, you're, you're hoping somebody, you know, the one guy you picked up has a touchdown. Running back wise, they're, you're hoping they get a touchdown. You know, the yardage really isn't there every game. Really just Josh Allen. Yeah, I still think that you're going to see a blow up game every now and then from John Brown just because Josh Allen does love himself the deep ball. Cole Beasley doesn't really generate much in the passing game. He's not a target monster like he was in Dallas by any means. On the running side of things, I do think now that you are starting to see Devin Singletary get inserted more into this lineup, it does kind of hurt Frank Gore, where Frank Gore was able to be in the legitimate flex conversation, be in the low-end running back two conversation. Now he's nine carries, 34 yards. That's definitely not something you want to see. With that said, it's still noticeable because it is three times that of what Devin Singletary had, three carries for 19 yards. I think at some point you will see the younger guy get some more work, but he still has to earn that job. Frank Gore, he's a veteran, and he's not going to give you anything. He's going to compete, and he's going to make Devin Singletary actually beat him for carries. Yeah, and plus Frank Gore has all those miles on him, but he still doesn't show them yet. So that's that's what's surprising about this is he's still chugging away, and he's still if he's the lone back in there. If, you know, if De- Devin Singletary gets hurt again, bam, right back into that flex option because he's so durable. I love Frank Gore. Shout out to Frank Gore. I love this guy. 
I think about how I'm 25 and everything in my body hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy is out there playing running back in the NFL in his late 30s. And I could conceivably see him playing into his 40s. In fact, everyone always talks about LeBron James playing with Bronny sometime soon. I've actually seen that Frank Gore's son is a pretty decent little running back himself. That, that dude, I, I saw the highlights of him. He's pretty good. It's, you know what it is, man? Those University of Miami running backs, the U. Somehow, some way, they've just produced some really good ones out there. That they do. But time to move on to the next game. And this game had some controversy. At the very end of the game, for some reason, they ran a fake field goal and they could have put the game away. They ran a fake field goal. Their holder running the ball got blown up, fumbled the ball. Defense scoop scored touchdown, but the refs called it down. Quick whistle. Titans ended up pulling this one off because of that. They won 27-23. So we're going to get more of that. These refs suck. These refs don't know how to call games, and rightfully so because they showed the replay. Clear fumble, clear recovery, and a touchdown, but that quick whistle blew it dead. They couldn't review it. However, it seems like Mike Evans only goes off whenever I play him, play against him. I've heard of worse problems. This is the second time I've played him this year in in Three, two of the three leagues. First time I played against him, he had the three touchdown game. Oh, uh, okay. So sorry, I maybe I misheard that. So playing against him, playing goes, against him. Okay, <laughs> that's a different so, story. <laughs> yeah, the first game that I played against him, he had three touchdowns. This week I'm playing against him. Eleven catches, 198, two touchdowns. So if you're Mike Evans, just play against Harris <laughs> in fantasy football. Yeah, apparently you're his good luck charm. Him him and Godwin, you still got to play them. Backfield-wise, though, still avoiding it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Jameis Winston almost outrushed this backfield. Combined, 53 yards for Jameis Winston, 55 yards for the combination of Ronald Jones and Peyton Barber. That's embarrassing. That, that is very embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, did someone tell Jameis there were some crab legs if he <laughs> ran to the end zone? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't see that coming, but I'm glad it's there. Um, <laughs> Jameis Winston, 301 yards through the air, one touchdown, one interception. Should have had a couple more that were just dropped by the defense. Yeah, Is he ever a streaming option? I know he's going to have that four or five touchdown game where he doesn't throw a pick, but if you stream him, you know you're, you run the risk of throwing five interceptions. Well, that's an interesting question because if you actually look at his season-long numbers right now, He's sitting in the top 12 quarterbacks for scoring. If you look at just the totality of his stats, it's easy to get lost in the numbers. But you forget just a couple weeks ago, he had that horrific performance where you could tell if he thought Mike Evans was wearing silver and blue against the Panthers. You know what I mean? Seriously, five interceptions, fumble. This is just the type of performance that you expect from Jameis Winston at this point. I think we know what he is. He's inconsistent. You're not going to be able to depend on him week to week from a real life perspective. From a fantasy perspective, he's just going to throw the numbers out there because most of the time his team is going to be down in games or going to be involved in shootouts. And I do think that, again, that just has merit in fantasy football. And he has the weapons around him to be able to put up decent performances. With that said, I'm still surprised O.J. Howard is just non-existent in this offense. Obviously, he's been dropped by most teams. Yeah, I don't know week. where the heck that guy went. But yeah, it's super disappointing. I would love if he got traded himself, but I don't know what the Tampa Bay Bucks are going to do. I do think Bruce Arians obviously wants to win, but I do think this season is now at the point where it's getting away from them. This is going to be a very interesting off season for them. Jameis is off of contract, and you have a quarterback whisperer at coach. Do you bring Jameis back? <laughs> Not. But, I mean, if, if they do get a quarterback that they bring in, you're going to have Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. My vote, the Tampa Bay Bucks and the Tennessee Titans switch Mariota and Winston, respectively. <laughs> <laughs> Live in purgatory for another five years. Yeah. It's, so, I mean, talk about the Titans side of things. So, Tannehill is actually looking pretty good, right? Three touchdowns in this game. Two touchdowns last week, one interception in two weeks, two starts. So, I mean – Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Tannehill, especially too, actually, from a fantasy football perspective, has been a good quarterback when he's been out there playing. 
The problem with Tannehill, he keeps getting hurt. He just, he just has that black stain on his career to this point. Now, I mean, you can't project injury. None of us alive can project injury. That's when you look, why when you look at our preseason rankings for this, don't look at like, oh, I picked the Steelers to make the playoffs. Look at, oh, I picked the Steelers to the playoffs before Big Ben got hurt. Yeah. So, for example. And I that's had Big of- Ben. I had the Chargers going 12-4 and four before 11 players on IR. Exactly. You can't, like, judge. Now, when it comes to Tannehill, like I said, like, in seasons past, he's been fine. He's been one of the better fantasy quarterbacks in the league. He even had, I want to say, and it's a while ago, so it escapes me. Out Three, four years back, he was a top 10 fantasy quarterback. With Adam Gase as coordinator, and obviously Adam Gase is a decent offensive mind. I can't say the same right now for what he has going on with Tennessee. But he does have decent weapons around him. Johnny Smith was one of the big performers of the weekend. Six receptions, 78 yards, and a touchdown on National Tight End Day. <laughs> Obviously, we are looking for people that we can plug and play at that position. Johnny Smith is someone to keep in mind if Delaney Walker continuously misses time. It is disappointing that the wide receivers, albeit Tannehill at three touchdowns, he only saw four combined catches between Corey Davis and A.J. Brown, two people that we expected to be at least higher up in the rankings at this point in the year. Yeah, especially with Tannehill, who can actually throw the ball. I was going to start to shift them more up into the rankings, but now I'm just seeing that, hey, I mean, Tannehill is just Mariota with a different number. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, A.J. Brown did come down with the touchdown. Obviously, again, love the touchdowns, but on this target share, it's a little bit worrisome. You're not going to count on consistency there. Yeah, but if you're still stuck in that trap of trying to trust Titan receivers, um, I mean, you really haven't been able to rely on any of them for three years now. I mean, and you're probably not in a position where you're considering the fantasy playoffs as a viable option at this point. Exactly. So. But we're here to help you bust the slump. <laughs> so let's go from that game to probably one of the worst games to actually watch this week. Broncos at Colts. It was just, yeah, it was a snooze fest. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at this. There's not really a lot of names that even stand out to me. Not a lot of people I really like. The only one that caught my eye was just, I wanted to see what Cortland Sutton was going to do with Emmanuel Sanders now officially gone. Was he going to officially establish himself as a wide receiver one? And the answer is no. He only had three catches, 72 yards, no score. You know, you, you can't really do much with that stat line. Yeah, and, and now we're going to get into the point where you can start pulling players off of IR. And on IR is sitting Drew Locke, their, mm-hmm. what, I think, second-round or third-round quarterback. So kind of see where he sits week 10. And then you're actually bringing in a young guy who can move throw the ball and you don't have statue Flacco just standing back there who's already annoyed with the offense if you saw his postgame presser where he said that they're afraid to do anything so I mean that's fair what's his name Rich Scangarello he's just not really an exciting offensive coordinator you could definitely tell I I did hear there's a little behind the scenes drama too with Emmanuel Sanders before yeah that'll traded. come out in a couple weeks yeah we don't know the full story there but I do believe there was some kind of history of him being a little bit frustrated with the offense. And I believe Skangarell is just as big a part of it because you don't even see Joe Flacco really taking shots right now down the field. Yeah, they're, none they're, at all. they're a very vanilla offense and even more vanilla than I thought Joe Flacco already was. Now how more vanilla can you get than Joe Flacco? I'm French, French vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> But so outside of those guys, the backfield now has been become a 50-50 split between Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman. None of them you can rely super heavily on. Freeman does have his two touchdown in two games, but before that didn't have any touchdowns. So right now they're just a decent flex option going forward. Marlon Mack, though, definitely. Start him. He's a workhorse. Jacoby Brissett is going to be a streaming option. T.Y., where where do you see T.Y.? I mean, he's been very inconsistent. I mean, that's about where T.Y.'s career has been. (laughs) He's he's just one of those receivers that's always been in the kind of like the Sean Jackson kind of purgatory where you're going to sometimes miss on a big week just because you're not going to be 100% confident of when to start him unless he's playing the Houston Texans. (laughs) Exactly, but... Definitely going to be a flex option, you know, low end wide receiver too. So let's go into the next game where ghosts are involved. 
Jets and Jags, Sam Darnold <laughs> saw some more ghosts because he had another three interceptions, but he helped himself out because he had two touchdowns. Yeah, I, I started Sam Darnold in a couple leagues this week. Like I mentioned when we were having discussions, Sam Darnold has a decent end-of-year schedule. So if he's out there, consider picking him up because I believe they play the Dolphins twice. To end yeah, the they year. got the Dolphins twice, Washington, Giants. Yeah. Like they just have very beatable defenses. So Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's what's going to get you, again, fantasy championships, picking up on these guys that have light schedules down the stretch run. So consider Sam Darnold. This is probably his toughest competition he's going to have for a little bit. Yeah, Le'Veon Bell, probably at an all-time low. You could probably trade for him. Good by um, low. By low, he's nine carries, 23 yards, three catches, 12 yards. So Lev Bell did not have a Lev Bell game. You could probably be like, hey, Lev Bell hasn't been doing good. You could probably finesse him out of you know whoever owns him. And then Robbie Anderson – Definitely pick him up. He didn't have a big game. He only had 43 yards, but he had two deep shots called back on penalties. He had a 92-yard touchdown called back, and he had a 60-yard catch called back on pass interference. So yeah, he's still you know top five in air yards, which means targets thrown to him however long it travels. That's an air yard for him. He's still top five in that, so he's still getting those deep shots. It's just hey, this time he had two penalties to kind of overturn those. So I'd mm-hmm. still look for him to be a flex option. Just know that, hey, he's going to have a floor of four points. Yeah. This is your window to buy on Jets players right now. It's It might close this week if you allow them to go past the Miami game because if they have a big one, everyone's going to want to jump on them on the waiver wire. We're going to tell you, get ahead of it. This is the time to strike. Yeah, uh, and then – National tight end day, their tight end Griffin, four catches, 66 yards, two touchdowns, and a two-point conversion. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but Chris Herndon is probably going to be the tight end you're going to want to look at Yeah, moving forward. Just, just, hey, tight end day, guess what? We got to highlight that tight end. Exactly. That's one um, tight end. <laughs> <laughs> Onto the Jag side, Minshew, 279, three touchdowns. Minshew Mania came back out. Regardless if they stay with Minshew or go back to Nick Foles, I don't think it has much of a effect on the team. They, they've seemed pretty much the same of how they would have been with mm-hmm. him. Only thing is I think maybe Chark takes a step down and D.D. Westbrook takes a step up. That's probably about it. I was going to take – yeah, so – you said D.D. Westbrook was going to take get elevated by Foles coming back into the offense, correct? Yeah, because it, all reports out of training camp was the rapport Foles was having with Westbrook. Yeah, and that's why you saw Westbrook's ADP jump up exponentially come draft time. Definitely consider that. If you're looking for wanting to flip players for D.D. Westbrook right now, you could probably buy him pretty cheap if he's not – floating around a waiver wire somewhere that's an option with that said I do think that when Nick Foles does come back this is gonna be a run first offense that's how I saw it before the season started so I do think Leonard Fournette I think Leonard Fournette's value is going to stay about where it is now he's consistently been a top five running back this year he has been running with authority he's been powering through guys that's just going to be what Leonard Fournette's going to be you are right with your analysis on what the wide receiver situation is going to look like. As far as Nick Foles himself, I would only consider him as a quarterback too, but I'm not going out of my way to start Nick Foles. He might pop off for, uh, hell, we've seen it before, a seven touchdown performance to start <laughs> yeah. his career. But that's nothing you can really count on. It's not every week he gets to play Tom Brady. <laughs> yeah it's really the only time he's done good but yeah. yeah so Chark had another touchdown I do see his target share where his big plays will still probably be there but right now he's the most targeted player on this team his target share is definitely going to drop because Minshew loves him and Foles loves another person so his yeah. is going to drop down um, but another player to kind of look at on the waiver wire, kind of give this one a, a little bit more thought, is Chris Conley. He's had a couple big games. He had four catches, 103 yards, and a touchdown. Against the Kansas City Chiefs, I believe he had another touchdown. Uh, he has like four or five touchdowns on the year now. So, you know, if somebody gets hurt, D.D. Westbrook, Keenan Cole, somebody like that, it might elevate his status to a flex player. But D. 
DJ Chark right now is a wide receiver one. So he's kind of kind of have to start him at this point until Nick Foles comes back. And then I would probably give it one week and then see where it goes from there. So let's go from down in Florida to up in New England. Browns 13, Pats 27. And here's another game where if the Patriots offense didn't take the field, they probably would have tied this game. Uh, They let up a touchdown, but heck, they scored another touchdown. (laughs) This defense is just, they're really good, except for I'm still based off of they really haven't played anybody. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why their numbers, I mean, they have a stretch where they come up and they play Kansas City, Houston, Philly, and Dallas. So that's going to be their stretch of actual winning team. So we'll kind of see if they're for real or not right when that happens. But Baker Mayfield, 194, one touchdown, one interception. The internet right now is just going to town on because he kind of threw it right to the guy. But <laughs> it was more of the, it was that offensive lineman's fault for just getting destroyed on that play. Because if Jarvis Landry saw that D lineman coming, he probably would have tried to swat it, but he got blown up on that play by that offensive lineman. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to not fault him on that one. Uh, Chubb, though, 134 on the ground, two fumbles to start off the freaking game. So you were looking good if you sat him like I did. Ended up having roughly 10 points, so kind of not good. Jarvis Landry, five catches, 65 yards. Left the game injured. It looks like it's probably a collarbone. So Well, he came back. Oh, did he come back? He did come back. I think he might have just jammed his shoulder or something. But still something to monitor. Yeah, OBJ, five catches, 52 yards. Really, this this whole offense outside of Chubb has kind of been severely downgraded, don't you say? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know really how I was going to really judge this Browns team going against the Patriots. And it was, we talked about it earlier, this was also an ugly weather game. It was pretty much raining throughout the entire contest. Weren't quite playing in the slop like Washington Niners last week, but... Still, nonetheless, you don't want your team having to slide around like some of these guys were. I, I think some of the notable people I'm looking at, particularly on the Brown side of things, is we're coming to the point where there's certain formats where I could see people making the argument to drop like a Jarvis Landry, and you're really considering benching Odell Beckham. I'm going to put him on my trade calls. You could probably trade him away based off his name and get something decent in return. If you need a running back, you probably get a running back two, you know, maybe even a tight end or something like that. So you might be able to trade him away. Well, I don't know, uh, honestly, on that one, too, because I do think that one of the drawbacks of this Browns team is they are so well publicized. So part of that is Odell Beckham's struggles are so well publicized to even the casual viewers. So I don't know if he can slide by on name value right now. Part of the struggle is the Browns just can't protect Baker long enough to really even hit Beckham downfield. Yeah, for all their acquisitions this this offseason it's terrible that their biggest move or the most impactful move was the trading away of their guard so hey that's coming back to haunt them now but on the Patriots side Brady 259 two touchdowns no interceptions Sony Michelle 74 yards James White four catches for 75 yards but Edelman, eight catches, 78 yards, and two touchdowns. I mean, Edelman's Edelman. He's going to get those numbers. It's going to be more Philip Dorsett. I feel like that's going to be taking that hit. Yeah, looking at this team construction, week to week, you're not really depending on a ton of these guys. Really, Edelman's the only one you can consistently start each and every week with confidence. Sony Michelle, he's on the lower end running back two spectrum. You're still going to have to throw him out there for the occasional week he had against the Jets last week. Three touchdowns. Yeah, exactly. Save most people on a Monday night. James White, he has a role in this offense consistently out of the backfield. There was, this is going to be PPR, though, not standard. Exactly. But, I mean, if he puts up 75 yards, that's a decent standard game, too, by itself. It's not a great offense, honestly. And I do think that we kind of just forget about that because how good the Patriots have been in their record, obviously. But from a fantasy perspective, there's not a lot of share this offense you really love. Even Brady himself is not among the top tier of fantasy quarterbacks at this point in his career. Yeah, really, it's just Edelman that you're going to be really starting with confidence because, I mean, heck, it's security blanket again, for lack of a better term. Yeah, some of these Browns players, I am intrigued to see how they bounce back to see if there's any, any parts of their schedule that they can perform better in. Because, again, it is a little unfair to compare them against this defense. We expected them as the underdog. 
it couldn't have been a worse scheduled game for the Browns, considering that they really needed a win, especially since they're at the point where they have to keep pace with Baltimore. The Browns' upcoming schedule, though, doesn't look particularly fun either. They have to play Buffalo. They play Denver, Pittsburgh. They get reprieve in Miami. Another Pittsburgh game. Again, Cincinnati, another good one. Arizona, a good one. Baltimore, you know what? I'll, I'll change that. Their end-of-the-year schedule is looking pretty good. If you can attack Cincinnati, Arizona, and Baltimore your last three weeks of the year. And you get that boost of, of Miami in between. Yeah. And it just you just hope that things aren't really snowballing on top of this team right now because, like you mentioned, the media is out to get them. Oh, you know? The media loves talking bad about them because exactly. they're so hyped. But now they're kind of falling flat. So let's get into the last afternoon game. Raiders 24, Texans 27. Yeah, we were all wrong about the Ra- Raiders, weren't we? <laughs> well, at what point in the season? Because there's two, two stretches <laughs> here. There's a point where I thought, oh, I was wrong at them because I expected them to be horrible. And then they won a couple games. And then there was a point where I expected them to be good because I picked them the last two weeks, including this game and the Packers game in an upset. They get blown out against the Packers, and then they lose this game eh, in a little bit of heartbreaking fashion because what were they supposed to do to stop Deshaun Watson on that final drive? Uh, kick all, him in the eye. Kick him in the eye. They roll up on his face. They had him practically on the ground. He spins out of the pocket and still delivers a strike to Darren Fells. Again, national tight end day. Darren Fells, two touchdowns. Yeah. It's, <laughs> the Raiders are the Titans of the AFC West. Yeah. I don't know, but I mean, let's see here. So Hunter Renfro had a long touchdown in this game. He's been pretty inconsistent throughout this year. Josh Jacobs played despite injury. He was had a little bit of a shoulder thing, so that's something to really keep in mind when you look at this Raiders team. If he does miss time, I expect Jalen Rashard to pick up more of a role in this offense. We've seen him have some history playing with Derek Carr and these other guys. And welcome back, Tyrell Williams. I mean, it's five games played, five touchdowns. It feels like forever since we were talking about him. He's been coming back from a foot injury, which you never want to hear with your wide receivers, your speedy wide receivers. Yeah, and he's going to have some touchdown regressions, five games played, five touchdowns, but he's only getting, I think his most catches is six catches. He's right around three catches a game, only broken 100 yards once. But, I mean, next week they get the Lions, and everybody's throwing on the Lions. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'd fire up Carr as a streaming option. Darren Waller, he had a touchdown, national touchdown day, or national tight end day. He had a touchdown. He had a very terrible game for his standards, at least two catches, 11 yards. But I'd probably fire up those three guys next week against the Lions. Yeah. If you're the Raiders, you're still in this weird stretch where you've just been on the road for practically an entire month and a half. Yeah, the the Chargers are going to be in the same boat. They have the game against Green Bay next week at home, and then they have five weeks (laughs) where they have a home game but it's in Mexico. So I was going to say, aren't the Chargers always on the road? Yes, they are always on the road. I'm just saying, in, they're not in L.A. <laughs> where they can uh, sleep in their own bed. Yeah, I, I want to squeeze this in. Not really, a, unless you're an IDP league, not really fantasy implications here, but get well soon, J.J. Watt. It's always rough when I see that guy go down, and he had a bounce-back season last year, and this year, again, he's leaving with a season-ending injury. Yeah, that, that's three of the last four years he's ended up on IR. Yeah, I, the guy's done so much. I mean, particularly now that I'm living out here in the great state of Texas, the guy's done so much for the communities down here, especially uh, on the hurricane a couple of years ago. Guy's a great guy. Uh, I don't know why his girlfriend has to mean mug him when looking at his text. I die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who are you uh, texting? My doctor. I'm going down this week. <laughs> uh, so on the Texan side, Deshaun Watson, 279, three touchdowns, no interceptions. DeAndre Hopkins, 11 catches, 109 yards. Darren Fells, six catches, 58 yards, two touchdowns. Carlos Hyde, though, 83 yards on the ground. I'm still kind of staying away from this backfield, though. Yeah, there's only so many backfields you can honestly stay away from, though. And I do think that at a certain point, you just have to throw out one of these guys. You just get boxed in that corner the deeper in the leagues you go. So I do think that Carlos Hyde, he's probably – at your lower spectrum of, I don't know, he's like a running back three. You don't like to throw him out there. You're not really expecting much. I'm happy if I get eight points out of Carlos Hyde in a given week, and that's what he gave you this week. Yeah, he's a decent flex option, but yeah, I, I still don't like him as a starting running back, though. So 
he's going to fall into some touchdowns. He's not really involved in the passing game. That's where Duke Johnson comes into play. I will say this, though. Deshaun Watson likes using his tight ends. Darren Fowles has gotten some work in this offense. Jordan Akins has gotten some work in this offense. You're going to drive yourself crazy trying to chase points and figure out which one's going to score. But I do think that at this point, Jordan Aiken's 18%, that ownership percentage needs to go up dramatically. Yeah. The, I mean, outside of DeAndre Hopkins now with Fuller Before. out, he, he has to throw it to somebody. And those tight ends now are starting to get a lot of work. So, yeah, I, I could stream them going forward. They have a couple good matchups. So, But, yeah, Deshaun Watson, definitely start him. Hopkins, you still have to start him. Would you rather go Hyde with the run game or Johnson with the pass game? I'd probably go with Hyde because I think his floor is a little higher than Johnson. Johnson so far is really only attacking on a couple catches, and I think this game he only had like 30-some yards. So unless he gets into the end zone, which he has yet to really do, I don't really trust Duke Johnson. I'm pretty sure most he's probably very unowned in a majority of leagues at this point. Yeah. All right, let's get into this last game before we do waiver wire and trade calls. Sunday night, can't really go into is Patrick Mahomes a choker in primetime because he didn't play in primetime this time. Packers pulled this one out, 31-24. Matt Moore, depending on Patrick Mahomes' health next week, might be a streaming option. 267, two touchdowns, no interceptions. This backfield, though, it's bit strange. Shady McCoy, uh, nine carries, 40 yards. Damian Williams did have a touchdown. Darren Williams had 40 yards, no touchdown. Tyree Kill, six catches, 76 yards. Travis Kelsey, four catches, 63 yards, and a touchdown. National tight end day. National tight end day. Hardman, two catches, 55 yards, and a touchdown. Sammy Watkins on his game back, five catches, 45 yards, no touchdowns. So yeah, I mean, that backfield is still a mess with split carries between three people now Mm -hmm. shady's getting most of the work and damien williams seems to only be getting second half work so that's not where you drafted him unfortunately (laughs) yeah as far as this goes so obviously the offense is going to take a step back without patrick mahomes that goes without saying but they still do have Andy Reid there. And Andy Reid is a, a dynamic enough player caller to make things work. Now, with that said, they didn't rule Patrick Mahomes out till Thursday, meaning they believe he probably might be able to start next week, in my mind. Now, a lot of people will question, is this is a wise decision to do with your franchise quarterback? But let's be real about this. And we talked about it just a little bit ago. The NFL is a league where if you're healthy, you play. If you're healthy enough to practice, you're healthy enough to play. So I don't think that you can reasonably justify sending out Patrick Mahomes if he's out there practicing with the team because you need to win games. The more it goes, you're falling behind in the standings to the Patriots. The Patriots probably have locked up home field at this point. So at this point, you just need to be able to even beat the Texans for that second seed. You need to start Patrick Mahomes. It's just you're forced in a situation where you have to do it. As far as the weapons around him, uh, the Tyree Kill, he's going to be fine regardless of who's throwing the ball. Same with Kelsey. Kelsey, Kelsey, yeah. Those guys, it it doesn't matter. You could start start me, and these guys are good (laughs) enough in offense to be able to produce. I mean, Cole Harmon, he's inconsistent, but someone to be stashed on your bench. Certainly, if Tyree Kill was to go down again, he's worth having on your roster. We talk about all the time with handcuffing running backs. Sometimes you just need to handcuff a wide receiver too. And I think Nicole Harmon fits exactly what Tyree Kill does. Now, Packers-wise, Aaron Rodgers, he's back to producing as a viable fantasy quarterback. Three touchdowns in this game. Had, a, obviously, his huge week last week against the Raiders. I think that a lot of our worries about whether he was still a decent enough starter are put to bed. Oh, yeah. He's back. That's what? Nine touchdowns in the last two games. They got some pretty good matchups coming up. You know, they got the Chargers. Ooh, maybe not. After the Chargers, they got Panthers, Niners. That'll be a pretty good matchup for you guys. But then he has easy. I mean, New York, Washington. He gets the Minnesota Vikings in championship game. So, a decent schedule going forward. Well, he has struggled against the Vikings in the last few seasons. That Mike Zimmer defense has put given him some trouble. So, I might sphere away from him down the stretch run. One thing I might consider doing is looking for a quarterback that schedule kind of works well with Rodgers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you have rushing-wise, Aaron Jones. Got it Aaron. right this time. 13 <laughs> carries, 67 yards, no touchdowns. 
but added seven catches, 159 yards, and two touchdowns through the air. So it is about a 70-30 split now between Jones and Jamal Williams. He had 10 touches to Aaron Jones's 20 touches. Jamal Williams did have a touchdown, so he is a definite flex option for you, especially next week against the Chargers. Like I said, Chargers are giving up 130 on the ground every week. So running back wise, they're definitely golden. But receivers, really nobody you know that I really want to start except for maybe when uh, Devontae Adams comes back. That's really it receiver wise. Like I said, we talked about A.J. Green. If he ends up there, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be awesome. So let's just break down the – or preview the Monday night game real quick. (laughs) Not much to talk about with this one. I mean, where's (laughs) Andrea? I'm not going to be starting any Miami players whatsoever. I might throw Devontae Parker out there. I don't – I wouldn't feel good about doing it, but – and deep league, yeah, I, I could see it. Pittsburgh wise, James Conner is going to ball out. I could see Juju having a, a breakout game finally. Yeah. You know, since there's not really much to talk about this game, I asked Andre his perspective on it. How done are you with the ESPN announce crew? Oh, I am. They needed Pat McAfee um, <laughs> terribly. Uh, they just need to blow up this. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's so bad. <laughs> like, I go. I didn't think it could get worse when they got rid of uh, Jason Witten, I was like, oh, they're, they're going to be better. Yeah, no, I, I was wrong. Well, you know, similarly pulling out a rabbit out of the head, they pulled a booger out of, I don't know, some mobile. But, yeah, God bless. They, it's a, it's a bad crew. They just have no chemistry. When I was watching the Niners Browns game and booger got stuck on that Kyle Juszczyk like loop where you could only say the name Kyle Juszczyk. I, I, I was like, God bless. I, I really don't want to see my Niners on Monday Night Football ever again as long as this announced crew is behind the booth. They they need to – And so how? ESPN with the Monday Night Football, they started with that like lime green bottom header. Yeah. Which every time it popped up, it looked like there was a flag and, you know, the internet bullied them into changing that. <laughs> Maybe the internet can bully them into changing this pair because it is – not good. I don't know what the, I don't even know how Miami and the Steelers got booked as a Monday night game, to be honest. Yeah, even because we knew this game was gonna be bad. That's why, honestly, I prefer Sunday night football right now terrible. because Sunday night football, at least they can flex out these bad games. Yeah, I, I just don't understand how you knew Miami was gonna be bad. I mean, you just what you were hoping Big Ben, really, that was it. Yeah, that that was the only star you were really going to be able to put out there on the field. I, granted, they probably didn't expect Miami to blow up their team to this extent by the time this game came through. But even still, let's who were you banking on for this Miami roster prior to them trading everyone? Minka Fitzpatrick was going to be who you're going to put out there. Well, I guess you could still technically put Minka Fitzpatrick out there, but <laughs> yeah, uh, Fitzmagic <laughs> really is going to be the header liner now. I mean, uh, dude. Obviously, I do a lot of the album covers for the show, and I traditionally have used the Monday night game. I was dying trying to pick pick two cover athletes for this week's preview. So over under, how many times does Booger say Fitzmagic? Oh, my God. Over (laughs) under. You got to give me a line, man. Uh, Let's say 15. (laughs) 15? Because he said use check like 40. All right. I, I got to go the over on that. I think he covers. <laughs> so, all right. At least that, he gave that's... me a, at least he gave me a project during that game. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to drinking bring... game guys. Oh my God. Yes. I don't know if this is going to be out in time, but we're going to have a drinking game. Every time he says fits magic, take a shot or a sit. <laughs> I'm all Whatever for it. Want to do. It's the only way you can watch that game. But is there a, is it a travel day tomorrow or is there going to be a game six? It's uh, actually the World Series should have been playing tonight, so yeah, it so would be a tra- it would have been travel. travel day. Dang it! So you can't even watch baseball. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a rough one. I'm sure there's some NBA action going on right now. Okay, well, you know, hey, you're you're on the show this week, so we'll talk about all things World Series and forget that go. this game ever existed. All right, exactly. wa- waiver wire. Uh, waiver so let's wire. get into trade calls real quick. Trade uh, away. I'm saying Melvin Gordon. I think he could capitalize on the two touchdowns in two games, saving his fantasy days. But both games, every game that he's been back, he's only had 30 yards. Get rid of him. 
Hopefully the Chargers can get rid of him, but I doubt that. Mm -hmm. Um, The offense runs better with Austin Eckler on the field and Austin Eckler touching the ball, not Melvin Gordon. And then trade four, I just put Jets players. Sam Darnold, Jameson Crowder, Robbie Anderson, and Chris Herndon. Like we said a couple times already, they're, they're, their second half of the season is just awesome, fantasy-wise. Yeah, there's tons of options right there to really consider. I definitely would look for those guys. Now, there's players, obviously we mentioned Odell Beckham. I feel like you are stuck in this position where you also have to trade away someone that play, people will actively want. So Odell Beckham, you're hoping you can get away with name value. But if you can't get away with name value, you're going to want to trade someone that's coming off a big week. So let's analyze some people at the top of this week's scoring leaders that you could potentially dump off on just because they did have a big week. David Montgomery. David Montgomery had a big week. It might be the only time you can really be able to get rid of him and sell him. That's an option right there for you. I do think that if what we're saying about Nick Foles is true, maybe DJ Chark, this is the time to start moving off of him a little bit. And yeah, that's really about it as far as people I want to trade away. You are right with the Jets players. I do think it's time to try and capitalize and pick some of them up. Maybe if you could still still AJ Green before he ends up on another roster, that's maybe a person to consider. Yeah, there's not a ton of people that are coming off injury that you could trade for, but I definitely have a few that I have lined up in our waiver wire that I'm interested to talk about. Yeah, so waiver wire targets. I got three quarterbacks for you. Sam Darnold, he is playing Miami. Derek Carr, he's playing Detroit. Everybody's been throwing on Detroit lately. And Minshew, he's getting Houston. Houston's secondary hasn't been the best. It could, though, be a AFC South game where it's 7-3. to three. But mm-hmm. I can see this one being a shootout where Minshew has to throw the ball. So those are going to be my three quarterbacks. Do you have any quarterbacks on the waiver? Um, None more than what you had there. I threw Mason Rudolph out there like a little bit ago because he does have some decent little matchups to throw out there. That's just a person to keep in mind if you're just hoping to plug and play as they go. All right. <laughs> Running back wise, we've kind of already mentioned these guys. I have Kenyon Drake and Rashad Penny. It'd be worth picking them up just because – We don't know if they're both on the trade block right now. Both teams are motivated to trade them away. So we can see them on a offense that actually uses them. So it might be worth picking them up. We can't really say where they're going yet. So let's just pick them up. And then Geis, he is on IR. The Redskins do get a favorable matchup. You know, going down the stretch, they get the Jets, Lions, Panthers, Green Bay, Philly, and the Giants. So they do have a couple good games in there. If he does come back, him having a decent game or two down the stretch. Yeah, those are pretty much the running backs I was going to throw out there myself. I do have an interesting couple wide receivers, if you don't mind me taking the lead on this one. Go right ahead. Deshaun Jackson, 60% owned. He's been dropped in a majority of leagues. He's set to come back. I do think that when he gets reinserted back into this Philadelphia offense, He's going to add another layer to them to make them better. Certainly, he came out swinging in week one and then got hurt on the opening drive in that week two matchup against the Falcons. So we haven't seen him. A lot of people have forgotten about him. Go snag him now that you still can. I do think that um, we talked about Harry as an option for the Patriots, rookie wide receiver. So we don't know what we're really getting out of him. But at the very least, the upside is there. He is going to have Tom Brady throwing him in the ball. He has worked with him in the offseason. Just we haven't seen him for this last few eight weeks. So fade routes. Again, he's, he's been a missing piece. And Josh Reynolds, we mentioned him earlier. Obviously, with Brandon Cook's injury, the Rams run the most three wide receiver sets in the league. So you know he's going to be out on the field. He's one of their main targets out there. At the very least, he has the opportunity to come down with something. I certainly would like him more in a PPR league than I would in a standard league. But Josh Reynolds has produced in this offense before, and he has the opportunity now. Yeah, so my receivers, Tyrell Williams, like I said, kind of have to go based off of what he's done. He has five games played, five touchdowns. Can't always count on that, but I mean, five games and five touchdowns. That's Can't beat that. And then Danny Amendola, especially in PPRs, second straight game of eight catches, flirted with 100 this time. He had 105 last week, so definitely go get those two guys. Tight end wise, I have Dallas Goddard, Chris Herndon, and then John New Smith is going to be a guy to look at if Delaney Walker is out again this next week. You know, look for John New Smith. He has filled in perfectly fine for Delaney Walker when he's been out. Those would be my three tight ends. 
tight end, I mean, the whole position's a wash. So, I mean, like I said, Darren Fell still 18%, and he's caught multiple touchdowns the last few weeks. So, I mean, yeah. go grab him. He's out there because you're not finding anything more reliable on the tight end position. And then last but not least, defense. I have one defense. Uh, that's just the Jets versus Miami. <laughs> yeah, Jets versus Miami. Like Anyone versus Miami, just <laughs> shoot them up the list, right? Exactly. Watch, they're going to um, win. They're going to win Monday. I, I hope. I hope they do. I really. If do. they if they do win, we're gonna have to call Andre to make sure he's okay. Oh yeah, no, we are not letting that man vacation in peace. <laughs> Just <laughs> text him. Hey, buddy, guess what happened on Monday? I I hey. honestly legitimately be worried for his health <laughs> at that point. Anyway, <laughs> moving Alrighty, on. So yeah. that's gonna be it for us, as always. Like, rate, subscribe, download, review, share everything. The podcast we're on Instagram. Instagram, uh, Slump Buster Podcast, Juju and I, Chris, Andre, we put out some of the funniest memes we could possibly find. Uh, that meme game is on point up there for the podcast or for the Instagram page. Twitter, Slump Buster Pod, Slump Buster FFB. Every Sunday morning, we're giving you out uh, lineup questions on Slump Buster FFB. We have the websites, theslumpbuster.com, all major streaming sites, Spotify, YouTube. Google Play, and iTunes. So pimp us out to all your friends. As always, talk shit to your fantasy mates. Juju, anything for you? No, I just want to say, so like I said, Eris will be joining me on Slump Buster with Juju and insert gray substitute here, Eris. <laughs> and then be sure to catch our new series that we started on YouTube this past month. Get your popcorn. We already have four movie reviews up. Major League, Bull Durham, Filled of Dreams just came out. The Sandlot, go back and watch that classic. And in a couple of weeks, one of the movies that divides generations, Space Jam, will be coming out here. So I hope you look forward to that one. Anyway, that's it for me, man. That's it for us. You guys have a great rest of your night. We will see you later on this week. Thanks.